I can't teach you anything. I can't tell you anything. All I can do is point toward and ask you to look at where we're pointing to, to see for yourself. Not talking to anybody. It's non duality we talk about. I'm not talking to anybody. I'm not talking to any mind. By that, not I mean I'm not talking to your body, mind, or entity. I'm talking to that I am, that I am. The I am that is that I am that's talking to that I am. Just to this, nothing else. Bob Adamson was born in 1928 in a farm in the outskirts of Melbourne, Australia. At the age of 15, he had his first encounter with alcohol, which developed into full-blown addiction. At 17, Bob joined the Navy, but after two and a half years, he was discharged because of his drinking issues. He got the name Sailor Bob at the Alcoholic Anonymous meetings that he'd started to attend. Tragic events showed Bob Adamson that he could decide to stop drinking and be given a second chance. I had no idea of being a seeker or being anything so-called spiritual as an out-and-out -out atheist. But the way life took me, took me to places where I had to look elsewhere and see elsewhere. And it was been the end of it. I saw maybe there was such a thing as a higher power or a God, which they tell, talk about in the fellowship, a higher power or a God as you understand it. Where I had it all blocked out, wouldn't have a bar of it, or a closed mind, as they say. A little chink in the armour came when I saw that maybe there is such a thing. And it was desperation and chronic alcoholism and psychological problems. Sick and tired of being sick and tired, if you like, whatever. Bob investigated many paths, including Pentecostalism, Methodism and Christian Science. He got baptised with full immersion and attended Mass. And in 1962, Bob started practising mantra meditation after seeing Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Eight years later, he joined Baba Muktananda core group in Melbourne and was given permission by him to initiate others with Shaktipat. Despite many spiritual experiences, Bob was unsatisfied. There was still an effort in gaining these states and Bob had yet to find the source that had given him a second chance. While spending time in the ashram of Baba Muktananda in Ganeshpuri, Bob came across the book, I Am That, by Nizagadatta Maharaj. Nizagadatta would be his final teacher. The main thing was, all the seeking dropped away. Though I was doing very strict disciplines, and repeating mantras and chanting and doing all the meditation and all the stuff at Muktananda's ashram, and I was staying there, but doing it earnestly and sincerely, and recognising what this Agadatta pointed out, that all dropped away. It wasn't like a big awakening or anything, it was just like a dawning, if you like to put it that way. Just like the sun comes over the horizon, ah, it was just like that. Things that I was locked into for years, and the, the dawning said, yes, I can't be this body mind that the Sagan Adam told me I wasn't. And if I'm not that, what must I be? I must can only be that, because that's the Maha Vakya. And uh, I recognise, I um, grasped what he said. Nizagadatta Maharaj is one of India's most respected sages of the 20th century. His collection of talks, I Am That, published in 1973, brought him worldwide recognition and is considered by many as a modern spiritual classic. Nizagadatta strictly adhered to the instruction of his guru, Siddharameshwar Maharaj, to attend to the sense, I am, and nothing else. 
in very few years he realised the self. Nizagadatta sold beedis, Indian cigarettes and held satsangs in his humble house in the Red District in Mumbai. He taught that mind must recognise and penetrate its own state of being. Nizagadatta is an exponent of Advaita, non-duality, but also emphasised love of God and Guru and the path of devotion. His message is simple. You are already what you are seeking. Don't disturb your mind with seeking. You are that. For several decades now, Bob Adamson has been sharing this understanding with all who come to listen. Bob holds meetings three times a week in his home in Melbourne, Australia. He draws people from around the world and his influence on the contemporary expression of non-duality is widely recognised. It's absolute certainty here that there is no individual entity that has any substance or any independent nature can stand apart from this manifestation or anything in it. And have a look at that yourself. See if you can stand apart from this presence awareness, which is another label the Buddhists put on. They say it's non-conceptual, ever fresh presence awareness. And they add on to it just this, nothing else, again pointing out that that is all there is. Christianity and other traditions use three aspects to point at it. Point at it. They call it omnipresence, omnipotence, omniscience. Omnipresence is total presence, omnipotence total power, and omniscience is total intelligence. Not three things, but three aspects of the light. Just the same as steam, water and ice are three aspects of H2O. There is nothing other than that. And they know, they tell you that in the, in the language says, because don't they say, I am that, this is that, that's the Mahavakya, the great word, thou art that, this is that, I am that, everything is that. Now, can anybody tell me what that is? Has that got any description or any shape and form? Has it got any back, any front, any height, any depth? It hasn't. And this presence awareness that you are, can you give me any that any shape, pattern and form? You, you put labels and concepts on it, but is it the presence awareness? I met Bob about seven years ago and I've been coming to his place probably close to three times a week for all that time. And uh, prior to that, I uh, was heavily engaged in seeking, looking for the way out, looking for a reward for all the work that I'd done. And it involved meditation and uh, austerities and dieting and a bit of seva service and all this sort of stuff. And then one day I just really thought, where is my reward for all this work that I've done for all this time? And um, I Google enlightenment and Bob popped up, I think in the first two or three entries on, um, on the web page. So I went to see him and I thought, I'll be able to tell this bloke a few things. Um, and uh, as soon as I walked in and I heard Bob talk, I thought he knows something that I don't know. So there was a very strong resonance, resonance there. And uh, I've been coming ever since. And uh, Bob essentially freed me from my um, seeking. So I don't look anymore. The seeking stopped, yeah, yeah. Not immediately, but uh, I'd have to say over time. But um, you know, that's certainly not there now. Well, if you are that seeker, you know, you've got to try and abide in that, but you can't. In recognition that you are not the seeker, you are the entity itself, there's a natural abiding, if you like to use that term, that comes about, that happens of itself. Sailor Bob has completely changed my perspective on life. Uh, 
I first started coming to see Sailor Bob in about 2007 and I was actually doing final year law exams and I was pretty sure I had an anxiety disorder and when he told me, you know, pause a thought, I was actually incapable of doing that at the time. My mind was racing. Um, I started coming three times a week, like as often as I could, and I got really immersed in the message. He said, you only have to hear this message once, but I used to feel like I came here and when I went back out into the world, I got sucked out of it. And he said, uh, you know, if, the, if it grows in you, then you'll be able to draw people in eventually. And um, I actually sat those final year exams without anxiety, which is, yeah, it's, it's quite amazing. And uh, now um, there is no firm belief in an eye here. There's just present moment functioning in the world. From a perspective of mind, uh, it's totally altered my life. Uh, but nothing's really happened. You know, it's just a seeming liberation from believing you're a separate entity. So, um, uh, but you know, life just flows the same way as it always did. Um, it's really about the message, not the messenger. It's, it's the intelligence that's um, kind of in the message that um, cuts through belief. And Bob was pointed to this, whatever you want to call this, by Nisargadatta, and he was pointed by some, somebody prior to him and blah, blah, blah. So on it goes back, but it's the same living intelligence that's not actually in time. It's timeless, timeless awareness. And that's, I mean, from a perspective of being a person, discovering that, it um, demolishes belief, belief in anything really. All beliefs are uh, cut through. So you see, it's all that one essence, what I call intelligence energy, I don't use the term God here, Purely and really, purely simply because we can get confused with that term, because we all of us come from some different tradition. Some of us might be atheists, some of us are agnostic, some of us could be Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Jews. If I start talking about God, I'll relate it to what my traditional belief is, what I've been taught, or what I've learned to understand, and not get a true picture of what I really am. Get a con a confused picture has been put out there by these different traditions who believe that their t description of it is right and the next one is wrong and all the rest of it. So dividing the indivisible. So that's what we basically point to here. Have a look, see, investigate if you are what you believe yourself to be, a human being. And you really know that you're not because a human being, because you call God the supreme being, you call yourself a human being. But what if you took the label off the supreme and the label human off and try and separate the beingness in this room? You realize you can't. And you look around the room and you say, that's being a chair, that's being Bill, that's being me, that's being you. It's all that beingness which we put labels or words on that differentiate it. What's this word I or me referring to? Isn't it referring to a conceptual image that I've got about myself? I, labels, I'm Bob, the Australian, I'm a good fellow, not so good, I'm unhappy or I'm depressed. Put a lot of labels on this pure intelligence energy and taken the word to be the thing. Given it some seeming substance and independent nature which is the cause of all our psychological suffering, the word. About four months ago, I really had a breakthrough due to the suffering coming out of relationship, being really painful. And 
seemingly it was necessary to kind of solidify the sense of self through which Bob walked me out, showing me the conceptual image that I was referring to as myself. And this was absolutely the most transformative experience in my life. Nothing is ever the same again. I mean, easy to say that I, I can't relate to the past anymore, more than to us uh, really just to evaluate seeming progress because there is no progress. Future stopped interesting me and I used to be an option thinking person. I used to always have a multitude of options. It fell away. And the presence just lit up, just become so much more intense and alive. And the joy of being came forth. And things started miraculously falling into place. Nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And so I got to tell you, nothing can trouble you excepting your own imagination. And what is imagination? Imaging in, we're creating conceptual images in our mind and believing in them. We'll have a look at this mind we pointed out before as a vibration. See how it functions. And see how mechanical it is in its functioning. It's a very useful instrument, but it's very self-destructing. And if you look at it closely, you'll see it's always vibrating in the interrelated opposites. Have a look and see and watch it. Because you're either in the past, which is memory, or the future, which is anticipation and imagination. It's either good or bad, pleasant or painful, happy, sad, loving, hating, positive, negative. Watch your mind and see if it's functioning any other way. Now I've got this conceptual image which becomes the ego. And we're told in the scriptures they've got to get rid of this ego. That's the problem. And stuff it under, stick it under the carpet, jump on it, kill it, do whatever you can to do, get rid of it. But if you point out here, if you look at it closely, you'll see it doesn't even exist. We've been bound to a fiction. We've been bound in this concept of fiction. And look at that ego is the cause of all my psychological suffering. And that's all that's cause and effect is. That's all that so-called karma is, is cause and effect. So it's only me that can be anxious. It's only me that can be fearful. It's only me that can be unhappy or depressed. This idea of me that we've added all these concepts to. Just pause the thought. If you ask yourself what is wrong with right now if I don't think about it, to really look at that, look and see what can I say about this without a thought. Pause the thought for a moment. And you realise you can't say anything about it at all, but you haven't stopped seeing, you haven't stopped hearing, you haven't stopped breathing or heart beating. All that functioning is going on. But thinking is paused for a moment. And you realise you haven't disappeared. You haven't fallen apart without the thought. The life is still there. But the mind has been paused for a moment. So you are beyond the mind at that point. You are prior to the thought. Because the next thought that comes up must start on what was there when the thought was stopped. Because if you were that thought and the thought stopped, that would be the finishing. But it's not. Bob in his opening spiel always says there's nothing anyone can teach you and there's nothing that anyone can show you. So implicit in that is the fact that you have to go and do the investigation yourself. So that's essential. You have to do an investigation. It doesn't matter what you think might be doing the investigation. Just go and do it. Um, and to do the investigation, there are, uh, Bob gives us lots of pointers and uh, at meetings there are lots and lots of concepts and there are lots of scripts and videos about Advaita, but it's very, very simple. If you just pick one of Bob's um, pointers, and my favourite is, is seeing happening now, then um, is seeing happening, I, I, I investigate and I see is it this mind-body that's seeing or is it just happening spontaneously? 
And to me, so to speak, that's very clear. And then what is this, what is this value or this, this um, other aspect that is seeking or seeing or thinking or hearing or in fact doing anything? It's not the body-mind, it is um, that cognizing emptiness that Bob refers to. There is just seeing. We are always the pure subjectivity, knowing or seeing. We can come up with all these concepts, but then always go back to the position of, yes, I know that concept. And that I is not a little I, it's the big I. It's the cognizing emptiness. It's the um, knowing or the seeing or the innate intelligence that just uh, <laughs> continuously <laughs> operates. And it can't not be that way. It can't not be that way. It has to be that way. The Buddhists, they call it a cognizing emptiness. It means an emptiness that is cognizing or knowing. When we think of cognizing, we think we are the cognizers. But it's not, it's a cognizing emptiness. And it's already been cognized. Now, when they're seeing it again or recognizing it, that's the recognizing of it. So that's what they say, recognizing. It's recognizing what you already are. See, what is the constant? And it's the constant that it gets seemingly obscured. That's why in the scriptures I'll call it ignorance. I'm not saying we're dull or stupid, but the meaning we are ignoring our true nature, focusing into the belief and concepts. So it's always there. And if you don't know the truth, and you're into this belief you are an entity, this is where all the psychological problem, pr troubles go, come, on, pr come from and come about from. And most of us are constantly in relating into the psychological problems to some extent or other, some worse than others. As we say here, it's not necessary to be that way. You can see through all this psychological stuff if you investigate. But another point we make is the false cannot stand up to investigation. If you investigate something and see that it doesn't stand up to that investigation, that it's false, then you are free of it. How can you believe in something that's false again? And you know that from the things you have investigated throughout your life and seen they're false. When you can't put any energy or belief in, are they going to exist or subsist there? And if had any existence, can they subsist there without a belief going into it? <coughs> And that is another thing we point out, that have a look at belief. The definition of belief is an unquestioned acceptance of something in the absence of reason. Acceptance of an alleged fact without positive knowledge or proof. And if I ask you, do you believe that you are or do you know that you are? You'll emphatically tell me, I know that I am. And nobody can knock you off that perch. You don't believe. You've got all sorts of conceptual images about yourself and the very fact of being you cannot negate. And all these things point to the truth, the actuality that we are, but we've got lost in the concepts, in the beliefs, ideas and images that have come upon us. How did all this happen? When we take on this belief out of the body mind, we need to look at that and see. Are you this body-mind that you think you are? And innately, you know you're not the body or the mind. Because don't you say my body? Don't you say my house, my car, my coat, my dress or whatever it is? Are you the coat, the car or the dress? You know you're not. So mightn't the same thing apply to your body if you investigate it? Just a label you put on this pattern of energy. And what is this body made up of? Investigate a little bit further and see for yourself. You realise this body is made up of elements. Made up of air, earth, fire, water, space. Just the same as the elements around you in this room and around you outside you. But have a look at that. Are you these elements? Are you the air, for instance? Can you separate yourself from the air? Are you separate entity, a believed in separate entity, separate from these elements? Separate yourself from the air if you can. 
And you realise you can't separate yourself from air. You wouldn't last too long if you stopped breathing, would you? You take the water out of your body. Your body's 80% water. See if you can live without, ele without that element. And you realise you can't. You die of thirst. Take the body temperature, the fire. And you get hypothermia and die. Get off the earth if you can. Get out of space. When you investigate and have a look at it, you realise you can't separate yourself from any of these things. So in essence, you must be all of these things. I work as a ship's officer. So basically I'm working on the bridge of the ship, pushing multitude of buttons, driving the, the machine, sometimes keeping it in place, sometimes moving it. And of course it involves a lot of planning. I have to know the wind and the thrusters and the, everything that I've learned. So the, the body has the skills already. So it doesn't need an entity to relate to whatever has been learned because it is in the, it is in the system. So basically the same activity is happening is only no stress associated to it. So the li likelihood of making a mistake is much, much lower. I'm basically discovering how the, how the living reality, how it is the truth at every moment that things needing done are appearing in my mind as a thought. And then basically thought generates action and the action happens through the body. And there is no need to worry about anything because when the thought is required, it will come. And for now, I know it for certain, it never fails. And if the thought doesn't come and something is neglected, brilliant, great. It didn't need the waste of energy, didn't need done. I'm still here. <laughs> and the same happened at work, where I work uh, in the environment that seemingly needs a lot of ego and controlling. It's just seemingly, it doesn't need anything. Driving the ships, I'm equally empty just following the thoughts and the actions that happen through the body. Really easy. <laughs> Bob talks about when we awake in the morning and open our eyes, we can look around without labeling anything. And I'm really aware now, again, when I came here, I couldn't do it, but when I first came here, I, can, I wake up and my thinking has not kicked in. I'm aware there's this space, there's this emptiness and that that's reality. And then the story of my day is born on that. Even, you know, I'll, I'll have woken from a dream sometimes. I'll wake up, I'll see that was a dream. I'll experience the spaciousness and then I'll see the story of the day start. It just enables me to function very well without having the belief in a reference point a me that's offended or a me that's got to do stuff. You know, the belief in doership has gone. Nobody can give you what you already are. Nobody can take away from you. It's just a matter of recognising what you already are. recognition that you're not the body and the mind, that needs to be understood to be the constant. But out of habit patterns, people go back into the belief in an I. It's like a cloud over the sun, as obscure as the sun. The cloud and the thought I obscures that pure intelligence. And so it's seemingly lost. But even though the sun is seemingly obscured by the cloud, the sun has never left the sky. And it's always self-shining, it can't leave the sky. It's the cloud that comes and goes. And when you look at yourself, what's going on in your own mind, you realize the thoughts that are coming out. That life essence is static, it hasn't, hasn't changed. If I ask you what happened to you when you were a little child, you say, I did so and so. I'll say, how do you know? You'll say, I was there. And I'll say, what was there? Did you have the same body as you got now? You didn't have the body of a little child. That, Bodies change constantly. Did you have the same concepts about yourself? You didn't, because you learnt a lot more. And you, so what was it was there? Mustn't it have been that innate life essence that had been the background of it all, constantly, never changing? So the changes that come about 
in the so-called empty world, as they call it, are fiction, fictitious. A Zen monk in the 16th century called it the unborn Buddha mind, and he says everything is perfectly resolved in the unborn. Why exchange the unborn for thought? If you bring it to the body, then there are a whole lot of things going on, like males growing and metabolism and assimilation and metabolization and whatever, just all happening spontaneously. So whether um, you know, this spontaneous aspect is a big clue to seeing that there is just this immediacy. And in that immediacy, in that moment, which is not even a moment, um, time or duration can't be. And, and neither can there be an I. And if you investigate along these lines, I think it's just, um, it's, it's very powerful. You give us lots of um, uh, clues on how to investigate, and that's what's always essential, just to see if there is an I there. And if there is no I there, whether you see that there is not an I or not, it doesn't really matter. But even if you can imagine that there is no I, you know, what would, what would that be like? If you could actually do the investigation and see that there is not an I, just see this spontaneity, this immediacy, and see that there is not an I. I mean, what an awesome thing to see. Um, if you see that now and reflect on three or four years ago when you perhaps didn't see it and you were struggling and you were a seeker, you would also know that that was the situation then, that there was no I. On reflection, um, there was no I, you know, three or four years ago either. It's such a big concept, time. Yes. And I was thinking, I guess, the other day about how, how is it that, you know, everybody believes in this thing called time. So without the belief in time, if you don't believe in time, they can't be a past or there can't be a future yeah. so you can't be plagued by thoughts of ah yeah. oh, i'm such an idiot i shouldn't have done this so that as soon as that comes up you realize that that actually wasn't uh, me doing anything because there's not a point in time that exists back there that you should be worried about so there's no past or future there's no time and there's no space there's no path no destination well, what's all this seeking all about <laughs> Does it mean you're already there? Have you ever got a path, haven't got a future, and then the destination to go to? And can you move away from being here now? Again, only conceptually. And conceptually, you've got to be in time again. Mm. So we believe in time, which is not the actual. So this moment is eternity. We're looking for the eternity, we're looking for eternal light. And we think it's six billion light years, we've got to come back, reincarnate, and all this other stuff. But at this moment, without beginning and end, it hasn't got any duration. It's a living intelligence, which is not in time. The mind is time, uh, and time doesn't really exist. It's just a concept. So. Um, the, the essence is the actual energy, if you like, the energy that's expressing itself as everything. And there's no separation. You, you're not separate from that. So the realisation is that I am that. And all of the, you know, the sages that saying, Tatswama see, I am that, that's what it's pointing at. Everyone is that whether they know it or not, as Bob says. The Sargadatta tells us that, he says, life lives on life. There is only life, there is no one who lives life. No one who lives, it's just life living itself in all the different pattern shapes and forms. Since I've been coming, there's been insights, uh, there's even been experiences of completely falling away, like experiencing myself as the seeing, in which everybody's actions and my actions are uh, being 
totally removed from it all, insides, all sorts of stuff. But, you know, I find myself still investigating uh, in patches, and I guess still searching. Even though there's a clear understanding, I guess it's not a clear understanding, but I'm still feeling it. And I just wonder, with all of this stuff kind of going on, like, what is it I'm missing? And why do I keep on going and turning it over? What, what you're missing is what Pabbage is that's cool off the search. <laughs> <laughs> All enough. <laughs> I'll recognise it never started. Yeah. And what are you, a being or a seeker? A being. Oh. So what is there to search for? And you've seen it yourself many times, Anne, that you're just carrying on with the old habit pattern. Oh, I think I've seen it. Because, I mean, I can't, you know, I mean, there's been all sorts of stuff has gone on, but I, and then my mind might come from saying, this is it, or I'm nearly there, or all sorts of stuff, you know, or mm. a resonation, or like a sense of, but I don't well, know if I can actually point and say, this is what he's been talking about. Yeah. But who are you relating all to this? Oh, yeah. Nearly there, and all the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if that relationship, relativity is not going on, relating to these, what are you? I've no idea. The, the, this, no, no, you have no idea. And you, and you never will have it. <laughs> because there's not an idea in the mind. No idea is good. Well, it's the interesting thing. When I started coming and listening to your talks, you say a lot of the same stuff over and over and over and over and over again. And it used to bug the crap out of me. Like I used to sit there and go, oh my God, can't this guy come up with something original? Of a thing. But the interesting thing for me is, you know, whenever there's that thought that comes up, it's ah, oh, you know, because you're not seeing it as fresh and new. You're basically referring it back to something apparently that happened in a, in a past time. And if you look at everything as fresh and new, that ultimately you've never repeated anything. <laughs> Pointing to the simplicity of the Advaita teaching, the non-duality, people say, oh, it's too simple. They try and ex explain it in words, concepts, ideas, and think this couldn't be it because of the simplicity. But is there anything simpler than one? You realise there can't be anything simpler than one. So nothing outside of it at all. So so-called everybody, everybody, no, I mean not all, all bodies, are that I am. They're not separate. There's nothing separate. Know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So you're free of the belief that there's an entity here that's got to do something, needs to abide or do anything. And it naturally comes about, and life comes about. I see it doesn't discriminate. Like some young people can get it, interestingly, others years and years. Others may never understand it. But ultimately, there's nothing to get anyway. So whether they know it or not, they've always been there. Well, when that I thought came upon you, about two, two and a half, your parents, school, society, and nations all reinforced it. And you have been reinforcing it every day yourself. Can you blame that habit pattern? can crop up for a moment or two, but if you recognise and say, it'll come up in your intelligence, hey, wait a minute, I saw through this, is it true? You know, no, can you find a static point where this is where I begin? You can't. So you see, it's just like a dream, you see water in the mirage when there's none. coming to me now is you know I've been coming here for a long time 
and I finally got to a point now where things will happen and my thoughts will come up and I can I can just watch it. Yeah. I can watch the dance, you know, and, and yeah. enjoy the dance. However, here's the but. <laughs> <laughs> There's always that thing for me, that, that questioning of the judgment or responsibility, you know, and I always like when you say, you know, responsibility, ability to respond to something. Um, yeah, I just find that there's all, there, there's always that judgment still there on when when you take ownership or when you're responsible for something. And I I know you're going to say that, you know that will just happen. It it will happen spontaneously. If responsibility is to happen, it'll happen. If ownership is to happen, it will happen. There is no no one doing, but the mind will come up with. Yeah. Yeah. If the real responses or activities come up, who's doing it? So when you say that, there's no judgment. No. It falls away. Just a spontaneous happening. But it's habitual to judge. It's habitual to judge. Yeah. Yes. So when does it fall away? When did it ever start? Oh God, hey me. <laughs> but nothing has ever happened when you murder. Nothing whatsoever has ever happened. No birth, no death, no uh, future, no past, no destination, no free will. It needs to be investigated. And that would, that will happen if it comes up too. Right? Because when you investigate, you see, the false cannot stand up to investigation. All these erroneous or false beliefs we've taken on will not stand up if you're going to investigate them and see if you can find any static point where any of them start from. There's no static point anywhere in this manifestation here. And there's no self-nature to it. Everything is that. The Sagrada used the term, realise you are dreaming a dream you call the world. And stop looking for ways out. The dream is not your concern. Your concern is that you love one part of the dream and not the other. He says either love all of it or none of it and the rest will be done for you. So they're not saying divide the dream into good and bad, which we tend to do, or not divide the words into good and bad. So that's where everything is at. The bad is that just as much as the good. From ordinary point of view, we think this universe is chaotic. But the universe is back, it's just as perfectly resolved, it's working itself out. Relaxing and watching the show doesn't mean to say you sit doing nothing. You'll find the body mind taking a very active part in it, but the recognition is there's no driver in the seat. The great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. When love and hate are both absent, everything is clear and undisguised. Make the smallest distinction, however, and heaven and earth are set its flare apart. And when no discriminating thoughts arise, the old mind ceases to exist. In the Hindu scriptures, what they call the five factors, Satchitananda, Nama Rupa, existence, consciousness, bliss, name and form. The Sargadatta describes it beautifully. A lot of people don't understand what he's saying. When he says, I know, when I know that I am nothing, that is wisdom. When I know that I am everything, that is love. And between those two, my life flows. Well, the wisdom of knowing that is Satchitananda, the existence, consciousness, bliss. The existence is the knowing. The consciousness is the being. And the bliss is the loving to be. None of them are separate. Existence, consciousness, and bliss are not separate, but it vibrates from one to the other constantly. If you come back to the immediacy of this living intelligence, this livingness, which is happening right now, Without a thought, without words, 
it's very clear and obvious. It's words that seem to divide. And that's what Bob pointed out to me and everyone else, that it's the word that divides. It doesn't really divide, but it appears to divide that uh, unicity, that uh, living consciousness or awareness. And the mind goes down these pathways uh, of belief in separation and it's all labels that and that's really significant to recognize that you know well what what about this question what are you without words you know you have to pause and have a look and what's recognized is that which cannot be negated which that is what you've always been and it's prior to the birth of the body it's eternity, you know. We are all of this one essence, no matter who you are, whoever you think you are, um, wherever you are in the so-called um, hierarchy of society, everyone is that. And that's that. Um, if you do the investigation and you see that the I is a phantom or an imagination, that's critical. And if you see that, then um, by doing some of the very simple um, uh, investigations that Bob points out, then it becomes clear that the I is really just another vibration, just like everything else. Yeah. For me, it was like, and, and they call this spiritual finishing school, you know, like there was the me that used to have to acquire a mass accumulate in order to patch up a fiction, wanting things from out there. And then the last, sticking point was the me that needed to seek enlightenment, that needed to get somewhere to have a flash of white light or for everything in the appearance to change. But right now is all there is. Well, there is no me, really. I mean, that's it. <laughs> No, there's no such thing as enlightenment because what we talk about, non-duality, one without a second, that is the absolute and there's nothing we can be taken from the absolute, nothing can be added to it. So there's nothing separate to be labelled as enlightened or anything else. It's the one essence that's patterning, expressing and appearing as everything, being, knowing and loving to be. Or another way of putting awareness of being is this. And the Sagada puts it another way again. He says, have an affectionate awareness of being. In other words, love yourself. Be that back to yourself. 